So the mayor is on our way, so I will um, just make a brief introduction of the person who is going to introduce the mayor. You can just stay, stay seated until she gets here, Susie. So Susie Rowe is past assistant U.S. attorney, and she's definitely a Gemini because there are two distinct sides of her. So I have three fun facts to share about Susie, and each one of these come with a very funny story, so you have to ask her about it. So the first one, Susie, who grew up in Spokane, was the story lady for the Spokane Public library and she says it's one of the best jobs ever. She was also the elevator operator in the US Senate building where she embarrassed herself with Robert when Robert Redford walked in. <laughs> and then she also spent a few months after graduated from Gonzaga Gozags, in Belfast working with children in a neighborhood center. She said the people were wonderful but it was a summer of hijacked buses rubber bullets, and art bombings. So that is Susie's introduction. Before the mayor gets here, let's do a table talk. And as soon as I ring the bell, we're going to stop so we can get the mayor on. Um, so the table talk is, if you were mayor for a day, what's the one thing you would change about the city? Go. All right, everybody, thank you. Um, nothing like keeping on your toes to keep things exciting. So the mayor is here. And so I will turn the mic over to Susie Rowe to introduce the mayor. All right, thank you. Um, as she walks in, let me just keep going. Uh, although she's following in the footsteps of the first, of Seattle's first woman mayor, Bertha Landis, Jenny Durkin <laughs> has a big announcement, a big welcome for herself, doesn't she? She's rapidly outstriding her predecessor, a native Washingtonian. Jenny was born into a rambunctious brood of eight children. She's a member of a well-known family uh, locally that is already in its second generation of community and political activism. A graduate of the University of Notre Dame, go Irish, and University of... Go yeah, go Irish. Thank you. And the University of somebody from Bama, I guess, and the University of Washington Law School. Her legal career, okay. Her legal career has included a variety of uh, jobs, including her private practice, uh, being a, doing a stint on the Washington State Bar Association's Board of Governors, teaching women uh, political strategy in Morocco, as part of the uh, Center for Women and Democracy, and serving as an advisor on Seattle Police Department's Firearms Review Board. Nominated, of course, by President Obama and confirmed by that U.S. Senate, she was the U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Washington from 2009 until 2014. Uh, I ran into her there and now and then. Um, she, during that time, one of the things she emphasized that I found important and different from some of the predecessors was her really uh, enthusiastic encouraging of the emerging field of investigating and prosecuting cybercrime. And it's something that stood her in good stead since. She returned to private practice in 2014 and in 2015 had quite a cool case when she represented the International Soccer Federation in the FIFA bribery scandal. But returning back to Bertha Landis, the prior woman mayor, when she ran in 1926, Mayor Landis ran on a platform of improving public transportation, uh, dealing with unemployment and the concurrent homelessness, and uh, ensuring that Seattle had an upright police force. Sound familiar? She also uh, campaigned on temperance, but we're through with that. <laughs> so many mayors have dealt with some of the chronic problems that, or problems that come and go over the years. And in the interim 90 years since Bertha Landis served, please welcome Jenny, Mayor Jenny Durkin as she addresses them currently. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you, Susie. What Susie really meant when I was US attorney is I worked for her. Um, <laughs> I was no fool. Uh, first, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to come speak to you all. Um, and I think also thank you very much for your commitment to serving Seattle. I know there's many times you could be many places 
and your ongoing commitment, both in the works you do, but also in, through Rotary, I think is really remarkable. And every time I come to Rotary, I remind myself of those principles that you remind yourself of every time, which I think really are important in this day, which is service above self, connecting for good, making Seattle better, and, and everyone needs to be at the table. Um, and I really believe that we need to have um, that kind of approach right now in Seattle. As people know, Seattle has grown so fast. Um, in the last five years, we've added almost 100,000 people to Seattle. And it is, as we know, that our land is limited, and as a result, uh, our infrastructure wasn't ready, so our housing costs went up because we didn't have enough housing. Our transportation worsened. Our social service infrastructure wasn't ready, which is evidenced by the way we deliver our services and the number of people experiencing homelessness. And I think if you look at this, we really are this time in, in where Seattle's under enormous pressure to change. We know it's become a city that's almost unaffordable for most people. Um, our communities of color have been pushed out in a rapid amount. And that while business has boomed in March of Seattle and we are the envy of the nation, we've also seen as that prosperity has grown that is not shared by all. And so our goal has been in city government is how do we make sure that the Seattle of the future is that city we can all believe in? Because we have always been that city that innovates. We imagine what that future is and then we go invent it. And if you look at the small mom and pop companies that start here, you know, it's things like Starbucks and Microsoft and Costco and Amazon. And, you know, we've got a, a roster of companies that began here, I think because we are that city that innovates and plans for the future. And if we look at what that future looks like for Seattle, we want to ensure that this remains the kind of city where people want to live, they want to raise their families, and they feel welcome. And that every part of our city has the diversity that we can believe in. That in the future, those parts of our city that today, I, I think most of you notice, Seattle's kind of under construction. Um, so let's build the city we want. Let's build a city that, so years from now, we've got that sound transit it is. And at every transit stop, it's a vibrant place like those great cities that we see across the world that have great plazas with restaurants and apartments and all kinds of housing, low income, medium market rate, everyone there together, that people can get around the city without ever having to get in their cars. I mean, when I travel to other cities, I don't rent cars, you know? And people here, if you think about where you go to New York and all that, you people need to be able to say, let's get out of our cars, let's walk, let's bike, let's live closer to where we can work. So we know that we have to add density. We know that that is a certainty where we are, but let's build it right and let's build it smart. We've got some amazing things underway um, that I think really will create this city as the next generation world-class city. Seattle, I'll give you two examples, the waterfront. I don't know if any of you saw yesterday, the Seattle Times had before and after pictures of about four blocks with the viaduct and with it gone, it looks like a different city. And if you haven't been down there, walk down there. The amount of light that now hits the street changes that whole neighborhood. And if you have a chance, go to the Pike Place Market <clears throat> at night, go to the back of the market at the Overlook, it's quiet. There's not the roar of the cars anymore and you see the city that's unfolding. We will have this connection between Seattle and Puget Sound in a way we never have. It's our heritage. Anyone who's been to San Francisco and goes to the Embarcadero and loves that open feeling, we're going to have that, only it's going to be better because we're going to have a 20-acre park. We're going to have a walk that goes from the market down to the new aquarium. And the new aquarium is going to have a spectacular new tank right there. There's going to be walking and biking. And then Expedia is moving in, and they have now built in a public promenade that will go around the whole campus. So you can walk literally from one end miles and miles and get a sense of that great part of our city. That waterfront is going to really transform our city and its relationship to all the rest of the downtown. Our new arena, um, if you haven't had a chance to go to the Science Center and next to the Science Center, they have an exhibit on what the arena is going to look like and what it's going to be like. It really is going to anchor that next generation of the Seattle Center. 
You know, I was a kid when they built the Space Needle, had the World's Fair. Everything was about the future. How could we capture the future? And Seattle did it. If you think about what we've done, you know, we made uh, airplane travel, a, a, we created that, Boeing, it, right here in Seattle. We're the ones that transformed aviation. And then we had the company that invented how to book it online. You know, we, inv I mean, if you think of the things we've done, coffee on every corner right here in Seattle, the best return policy anywhere, Nordstrom's. Um, you know, you look at when it comes to those things that really dictate how we are. I don't want to overlook the cheap hot dog at Costco. Um, but truly, if you just look not just at the companies we've built, but what the approach is, we've got to create that next future. We have to make sure that Seattle stays that, com that city that continues to innovate, continues to plan for the future, and continues to stand for the values that we believe in. You know, we are a city that has been built on a lot of different diversities, and we have thrived because of it. If you look at the statistics since in the last six years, I think it is, the majority of growth that has come has not just come from people coming from other regions, it's from people from other countries. We now have more immigrants from other countries than almost anywhere in America in our growth percentage-wise. And we're better because of it. We are thriving. If you look at our economy, when I talk to mayors across the country, we have our challenges, and we'll talk about those, I'm sure, in the question and answer. But the benefits we have comes down to the people. I believe that we have great challenges, but our people are greater. And that if you look at the challenges today, which are those challenges that come from growth and success, the main challenge is how do we make sure that that prosperity is shared more by all. And that's why I really want to thank people in this room and think of people across the city. When we went to the voters and said, look, we've got 740,000 jobs that are going to be created in Puget Sound in the next five years. Think about that for a minute, 740,000 jobs. The majority of them are going to require some post high school college education certificate degree or training. And only 30% of our kids were getting that. So we were telling 70% of our kids, you are locked out of those jobs of the future. That will never give us that ladder we need to prosperity. So we came and we made a proposal. We said, look, let's give families a leg up. Let's make sure that we double the amount of preschool so kids show up at kindergarten ready to learn. Let's focus some additional resources on K through 12 to close the opportunity gap. And then if kids do what we ask them to do by actually graduating, we're going to give them two years free college. And 70% of voters said yes. And in, I think it's two weeks, our first class of college promise scholars are gonna graduate from the Seattle colleges. And they're gonna go on, it's amazing. We know that it matters, the opportunity people are given. And now we're trying to say, okay, we don't want it just to be a checkbox thing that you two years more college check. We are gonna match up those opportunities with the great employment opportunities we have here. Between our trades and our laborers, unions, and our businesses, we have some of the best jobs anywhere. So we're now created what we call business opportunity. And if you haven't heard from it or your, your business isn't involved, make sure you contact me or my office because we're now trying to create internships and jobs for all those kids. So starting in high school, we really create the opportunities for kids to get in and get those work skills and for us to develop the workforce of the future. And then for those students that go on for those two years of college, we're going to make sure that we also match it up with real opportunities for work and what they're interested in so that when they graduate, they actually have a family wage job. And it's great, it has worked. We did a pilot with Kaiser Permanente who has just been a fabulous partner on a whole range of issues. Um, but they said, look, we're struggling to get med techs. We need more med techs, we don't have enough of them. So they went with the Seattle colleges, they created a program where they paid for the college tuition and the training and said, if you give them these credentials, when they're done, we'll hire them. And the, earlier this year, end of last year, my calendar blurs now, um, they had their first graduation. We had a room 
of like 10 tables of graduates with their families who are not only graduating from college, they were getting a job in the medical tech field. We can do that. We can make sure that the kids from Seattle get the great jobs in Seattle. And if we build that opportunity, yeah, we should clap for that. <clears throat> Because I love that we've got world-class jobs here and we're building world-class startups and companies, but I want our kids to benefit. I want to make sure that when our kids grow up here, they get tapped into that and we don't have to import our talent, that we're cultivating the great talent we have right here at home. And so I know that your, your Rotary has been involved in a whole range of programs like this, um, both locally and internationally. But I think, you know, look at yourself and your own businesses. If you've got room for interns or employees or you know that you have a hard time getting and recruiting the right people, talk to us. Because we have this whole cadre of, of students now who are coming up, who are hungry, who are smart, that we're going to open the door of opportunity. And if we do it right, they're going to carry us into the future to make Seattle the place we want to be. So thank you for everything you do. And I want to leave some questions, time for questions, I know. And we've got a rosy microphone. Come on, let's have some questions. Susie's going to do Oprah. I know. <laughs> Just like jury selection. <clears throat> There's no one way in the back here, too. Thank you. Lauren, I'm headed your way. Start standing up. Thanks for being here, Mayor. Um, I just have a question more about how you're connecting Seattle to the greater region and the work you're doing to build really that, that regional future plan because as we know, we're growing. It's not just Seattle, it's Seattle, the east side, north, south. So how, you know, what conversations are happening there and what real plan is coming out of that work? Thank you very much. It's a really important question and I will say that when I first came in, a lot of towns um, and cities from around the area distrust Seattle a little bit. Um, and so I'm a real regionalist. Um, I think every time someone builds housing anywhere in the region, it's good for Seattle. Anytime someone creates a job in the region, it's good for Seattle. We are, we are now competing with global powers. We've got to make sure that this region thrives as a region and that none of these issues that we're facing, whether it's homelessness or transportation, they don't stop at city borders. And if we don't have collective regional solutions and opportunities, so a couple of things we're doing. First, in homelessness. We have made uh, an unprecedented collaboration with King County in addressing our homeless response. Because what we came when I came in, I found out, and I didn't know this before as mayor, and I should have known it, is the city of Seattle controls the dollars that provide the emergency response, mostly shelters and the shelter response. But King County controls the dollars that, that deal with the behavioral health issues, mental health, addiction services, and the like. Obviously, you need to address it holistically. So we had a fractured system. So working with the county executive, Dow Constantine, I said, like, we agreed, let's bring it under one roof. Let's create one regional system that has all the resources, everyone pulling in the same direction under one roof. And we are well on our way to doing that. We signed a memorandum of understanding. We hired the consultants. We're working with business and philanthropy. We're working with the county council, the city council, and stakeholders. And hopefully, by the end of this year, we will have one regional authority that deals with the system so that we will be able to have more efficient and more holistic responses. We're already seeing it pay off. While it is only one number one time, for the first time since 2012, our one night count showed a decrease in the number of people experiencing homelessness. We have increased shelter by 25%. We have increased our permanent support of housing. We're working to, with our providers better, so we're requiring more accountability. As a result, we've changed over the types of shelters we have. We used to have what just mats on the floor was our typical shelter, which can are an emergency service we need in some circumstances. But we found that if we provide those wraparound services to people at the time, we call those enhanced shelters, it is more likely to move them from homelessness to long-term housing. And indeed, last year we found out it was five times more effective from enhanced shelters than unenhanced shelters. And as a result, last year, the city of Seattle moved over 5,000 people from homelessness to housing. 5,000 people. 
Question from Ken Grant. Curious what keeps you up at night? Oh, what keeps me up at night? Who sleeps? <laughs> Look, I, I, it is a, um, I feel enormous responsibility for, for the well-being of people in our city. And I think that we, you know, every, the whole range of things. But I think that the, the people who have left behind and have the least keep me up the most. You know, so that we have, you know, we are doing more uh, for people experiencing homelessness, but you can't go anywhere in the city and not realize we have to do even more. Um, we know that uh, parts of our city have prospered greatly, but parts of our city have been left behind. And I feel enormous responsibility to make sure that when we have opportunity and prosperity, it's widely shared. Public safety is always something that, you know, Chief Best and I talk many weeks, many times a day. Um, and if there's a, you know, an officer involved shooting or uh, any kind of significant crime in the middle of the night, we talk. I mean, so those are the things that you look like the life of the city. But then you're also looking at how do we make sure we retain the vitality? Um, we're in a boom right now, but anyone who's lived in Seattle for a very long time, it's cyclical. And we're already projecting that our revenues will be decreasing in 18 months and we'll start to see some kind of recession. I lived here during the Boeing bust, you know, as a kid, and I saw once vital neighborhoods literally empty out overnight with weeds growing in the yard and empty cul-de-sacs. So what keeps me up is how do we make sure that we keep the vitality and how do we make sure that it's more shared? A question here. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, less use of cars. Uh, where are those that are trying to use mass transit and the, uh, that type of transportation supposed to park? Right now, most of the park and rides are completely full, and I see them building new things, but usually with no place to park to, for the people to use them. Great question. So the <clears throat> there's two parts to it. There's the commuters who live in the city, um, which we've done, you know, we have now, the majority of the Seattle population lives within a walking distance of a good bus line or transit line. But we know we need to do more. For example, our rapid ride lines are, you can, the first bus will fill up, sometimes the second bus. We're one of the few cities in America that our use of transit is actually increasing. Um, and our, and our, our, our investments of that have paid off. For people moving from outside the city into the city, we have to do a whole other range of challenges. And that's one, again, where we go back to the regionalism question. You know, we can't let our transportation policy stop at the city borders. And so we're working with King County Metro very, very closely with the State Department of Transportation and with Sound Transit to say, how do we build more capacity coming in? So when we had the Seattle squeeze, we said, okay, where are people coming from and how do we get them onto buses or onto light rail or onto the foot ferry? And so we're trying some very innovative things. Um, one is we increase the number of ferries, the passenger only ferries from West Seattle. People love it. We also paired that with a new thing called Ride 2, starting in January, so it's not so new now, except for we just started in the South End, which is basically an Uber, Lyft type of delivery, but it's transit. It's a van. You can call it on your app if you live in the neighborhood, and it will drive you to either the Rapid Ride Line or to the Water Ferry. So we have in West Seattle, people love them. We tried it in South, we now have it in South Seattle. We rolled it about about a month ago. So it's South Seattle, Tukwila, and the South End because there it's really hard to get to the good bus lanes and transit lanes from neighborhoods. It is the highest used ride to now. So people are using it on demand. You get on with your ORCA card, you get the transfer, and you use that transfer. So you only pay once. Um, we're talking to Sound Transit and to Metro on how do we create more uh, uh, park and ride spaces so that we know if we really want people not to commute into Seattle in their cars, we gotta give them the ability to park somewhere and get it on. So we are continuing those conversations when Northgate opens, that's gonna help a lot, but we see it already. If you don't get, you know, at Linwood, there's a couple of park and rides. If you don't get there by 6.30 in the morning, you're kinda out of luck, and so you just hop onto I-5. So we've identified, okay, where are those pressure points and how do we work with Snohomish County, Sound Transit, WashDOT, 
to get more capability outside the city to keep, get people out of their cars. Am I done? Thank you very much. I gave too long answers. Thank you very much.